people have um, strong feelings about where these various classes of um, meteorites fit in the asteroid belt, but the reality is there's great uncertainty. There's also um, the fact that these are biased samples. Meteorites are, are rocks. They're tough things, and um, most of them, most of the most primitive materials disintegrate on Earth through weathering very quickly. Primitive samples are therefore very rare. About 95% of uh, the meteorites we, we find are not primitive. So they lack geological context, and all, all samples are essentially contaminated immediately as soon as they reach the Earth. So why do we care about primitive materials, and what does that even mean? Well, when I say primitive materials, I'm talking about um, samples that contain uh, remnants of the first building blocks of the solar system. These are really th the, uh, materials that predate the origins of the planets and even the sun. One of the most interesting types of primitive materials inside meteorites and comet dust are organics, of course, because uh, we are still learning about the origin of life, but um, many uh, scientists believe that the most important organics uh, that gave rise, to, uh, gave rise to life were delivered um, from space. Um, there's a lot of um, rich uh, chemical environments in, in space, like these cold molecular clouds, and astronomers can see um, different kinds of chemistry occurring in these, these regimes than you might find in early Earth. And we find little remnants of organic matter. These, this what you see here, this is a, a little uh, three donuts sort of a thing. This is carbonaceous material. You're looking at it um, in, in a transmission electron microscope. Extraordinary detail. We can see the elements that are in there. We take the same sample and put it in the machine that I have over at NASA, and then we can measure the isotope properties. Um, the isotope compositions of these samples are unlike anything that you would find on Earth uh, at any scale. They're enriched in the heavy isotopes of hydrogen and nitrogen. We think that is an indication of ultra-low temperature chemistry, the type of chemistry that only happens in interstellar clouds. On the other hand, in the same rocks, the very same rocks where we have these materials that form near absolute zero. We have chondrules and calcium aluminum rich inclusions, which are materials that definitely formed in the solar system at, at ultra high temperatures. So we're interested in, in, in addressing these questions. How did the most fragile primordial materials end up in the same rock as these most refractory materials uh, that are known to man? So this leads into uh, some planetary science decadal survey questions that OSIRIS-REx will address. What were the initial stages, conditions, and processes of solar system formation and the nature of interstellar matter that was incorporated? How did the giant planets and the satellite systems accrete, and is there evidence that they migrated to new orbital positions? What governed the accretion, supply of water, chemistry, and internal differenti differentiation of inner planets and the evolution of their atmospheres, and what role did bombardment by large, large projectiles play? This, uh, addressing all these questions in the same sample requires going to a primitive body that retains the, the primitive signatures. So we have practically uh, a million asteroids literally to choose from if we want to go get a sample. Uh, right off the bat, um, we, to down select the target, we have to go to a near Earth asteroid. This is just a matter of time and money. Um, any, all of these uh, bodies are accessible, just takes a lot more time and money to get to the outer asteroid belt. But there's plenty of interesting objects that uh, are near, in near Earth orbit. Among those, there are about 192 we identified that have orbits, orbits that were optimal for sample return. Among these, uh, 26 had diameters that were large enough. Um, I'll explain why that is important. Five of these were determined by astronomers to be carbonaceous, and only asteroid Bennu was uh, well enough characterized at the time we wrote our proposal uh, to be the target for selection. So I'll go through a few of these um, criteria for how we chose the targets. First of all, the orbit. Um, use of solar power means we can't be uh, uh, operating in the outer solar system for a long period of time. We can't be too close to the sun or it'll cook the spacecraft. It's also important to go to a target with a low inclination, so in the, uh, near the same plane as the Earth. 
um, then it meets these requirements. Next, why do we have to go to a large-ish body, at least 200 meters? Well, all bodies in space are, are rotating, and the smaller the body, the faster the rotation. And there are some uh, asteroids with periods as, as low as a minute. Why does that matter? Uh, because the way that we're going to uh, grab the sample is to match the rotation period of the, sa of the asteroid so that we can uh, uh, safely approach the target. Um, and also, uh, if bodies are rotating too fast, it just flings off the loose material, which is called regolith. So I'll be using that term perhaps through the talk. And what we mean by regolith is simply loose rocks, um, not bedrock. So this is a sampleable material. This is regolith from uh, Itokawa. And finally, composition. Um, we want to go to an asteroid and get a sample so we know what it's made of, but, as but astronomers uh, can give us some clues based on reflectance spectroscopy. This may not look much like much to you, but um, a lot of work goes into interpreting these spectra. Uh, Bennu is a type, so-called type B asteroid with a very low albedo. Uh, our best uh, information is that this is um, these type, type B asteroids are water-rich and uh, organic bearing. So asteroid, uh, so Bennu is probably like CI or CM carbonaceous chondrite meteorites, although we don't know for sure. So asteroid Bennu is one of the most extensively characterized uh, asteroids. All of these uh, assets have been brought to bear on, on Bennu to uh, characterize its shape, size, uh, spin rate, um, even the regolith properties, and so on. Of course, astro analysis of the sample will return uh, provide actual ground truth to these inferences. At least the orbit is exceptionally well known. This is very impressive. Look at the number of data um, points to the right of the decimal place here. The semi-major axis is known to better than seven meters. All right, that's well inside the asteroid. This is very important so that we can do mission planning um, years in advance. Uh, radar images from the Earth also, um, again, it doesn't look like much, but it um, tells us that there's only one large boulder on the surface, that it's a spinning top, um, and so on, and it tells us something about a possible formation and, and movement of regolith on the surface. So we have a target. Uh, it's well characterized, and here are the OSIRIS-X mission objectives. So characterize the integrated global properties of a primitive carbonaceous asteroid to allow for a direct comparison with ground-based telescopic data of the entire asteroid population. Map the global properties, chemistry, and mineralogy of carbonaceous primitive asteroid to characterize its geological and dynamic history and provide context for return samples. Document the texture, morphology of chemistry, and spectral properties of the regolith at the sampling site down to scales of sub-centimeter. Our primary mission goal, of course, is to return and analyze a sample of pristine carbonaceous asteroid regolith in an amount um, sufficient to study the nature, history, and distribution of constituent minerals and organic materials. And our mission requirement is to bring back at least 60 grams of material. Finally, measure the Yarkovsky effect of a potentially hazardous asteroid and constrain the asteroid properties that continue this, uh, contribute to this effect. You can see that uh, the first three mission objectives require extensive remote sensing campa campaign by the spacecraft prior to sampling. And we will be at the um, orbiting uh, in the vicinity of Bennu uh, for over a year doing extensive um, camp, uh, remote sensing campaign. We also need this to identify a safe, sampleable site with high science value. Before I get to the sampling, I want to uh, sidestep a bit for the explain what we mean by this Yarkovsky effect. The issue is that um, asteroids have been in in stable orbits for billions of years. And so why, do, once in a while, do we have these massive impacts of very large um, asteroids? It turns out that all of uh, these uh, bodies in the solar system are, are subject to non-gravitational forces um, by radiation. Uh, the Arkovsky effect is a very gentle, very gradual acceleration due to thermal radiation. And I'll show a slide next what, what that means. 
the point is that these effects accumulate over millions of millions of years. It's extremely weak, but there's a long, long time. And so um, predicting the Yarkovsky effect requires knowing the properties of the asteroid because these re-radiation of, of the light, um, it's not me, uh, it depends upon all the composition of the asteroid and also its shape. Bennu turns out to be um, one of the most dangerous near-Earth objects. It's in the top five, at least, of uh, impact hazard probability. The last number I saw was close to 0.04% within the next 200 years. Uh, that doesn't perhaps sound like much, but it's in between uh, this impactor and this impactor in size. So we're going to, Bennu is about 500 meters. Meteor Crater was um, made by a little guy only 50 meters across. The dinosaur killer was 10 kilometers ac across. So the Yarkovsky effect uh, comes about by uh, bodies that uh, um, absorb radiation from the sun, rotate, and then re-radiate the ra radiation uh, into space. It's the re-radiation of this energy that causes the acceleration. And which direction it pushes the asteroid depends of what, on how it's rotating and so on. I won't go into those details. But I, I want to point out that Bennu uh, has already been found to deviate from its pure gravity-ruled orbit by over 160 kilometers in just 12 years. So this is a very significant effect. We have a, a large science team that's very experienced, um, both on the engineering side and the, and the science side. Um, there are folks on our team on the engineering side who were uh, running missions uh, that I was reading about when I was a little boy. And it, it was a, just amazing to meet these people and end up working with them for, for years. A very impressive amount of detailed, in-depth knowledge on practically any aspect you can imagine of flying a spacecraft or analyzing the sample. Great thing that I like about this mission is that uh, there was a philosophy from the very beginning that the science team and engineering teams worked together from the from the start. Uh, this has been a historically a sense of tension in a lot of missions because scientists um, want to do lots of unsafe things, and um, engineers are loath to do that. Um, but we have. Uh, by working together, we're able to make those compromises um, early in everybody's satisfaction. So as was mentioned, uh, JSC has a very significant contribution to OSIRIS-REx. Some of the mo some of the key um, members of the science team are right here in this audience, actually. So Lindsey Keller, uh, I've been working with Lindsey for over 20 years. He's a co-investigator. He leads the Carbonaceous Meteorite Working Group. He runs the Transmission Electron Microscope Facility here. Um, I am also a co I and I um, am leading the sample analysis working group, and I run an ion microprobe laboratory at JSC, right across the hall from Lindsay's uh, um, laboratory. Keiko Nakamura Messenger is a co I, and she leads the sample site science working group, and she's the deputy Osiris Rex curator. She's also the NASA um, curator for the Hayabusa 2 samples that we'll be receiving soon. Uh, Kevin Ryder is the co-investigator and the OSIRIS-REx um, sample curator and also NASA's Antarctic Meteorite sample curator. Uh, uh, collaborator Simon Clement is uh, manager of a unique laser or organic mass spectrometer that he designed and built. He's our um, uh, local mad scientist. Uh, Aaron Burton is also a collaborator. He, he also studies organic matter in a different way, and these are complementary um, ways of looking at organic matter. These are soluble organics rather than uh, tiny scale organics. And Kathy thomas Kepta, she's also a collaborator. She's leading the analysis of contamination knowledge surfaces for OSIRIS-REx. So unlike most people, when you clean something, um, we actually care about what the dust particles are that are getting into spacecraft. So she's looked at thousands of dust particles um, over the last year, looking at their compositions. And this, is, this will be important for uh, uh, scientists to be able to interpret the data when the sample comes back. We do have a spacecraft. It's, it's done. Um, it's complete, and it is beautiful. I'll run through a few of the um, remote sensing instruments. We have three different cameras that are um, 
have different roles in the mission depending upon uh, how far we are from the uh, target and what level of detail and, and so on. So we will start imaging the um, asteroid more than a million kilometers out and we'll be imaging it all the way up until uh, samples collected with in various ways. OLA is, uh, is one of these things. It's a laser. Uh, it's used to measure the distance from the spacecraft to the surface of the asteroid with uh, great uh, accuracy. And it will help us to form a shape model of the asteroid and also will help tell the um, spacecraft when it's in the appropriate place to do various maneuvers. We have two different spectrometers. These are used to map the composition of the, sa of the asteroid. Uh, in under different spectral ranges. Uh, Ovier's is mapping from 0.4 to 4.3 microns. This helps us, uh, this is used to determine the uh, a reflectance albedo, how much of the light is bouncing off the asteroid, and to look for organic features. Uh, OTES is a thermal uh, a sp a spectrometer that um, covers a speckle range where we look, we can see lots of mineralogical features. Radio science is simply a way of looking at the time delay between Earth and the, and the spacecraft. Uh, how long does it take the, the signals to get back and forth? And by looking at this in incredible detail, we can actually determine the internal mass distribution of the asteroid by how much the asteroid is deflecting the spacecraft. Arexis is a student instrument. It's an uh, X-ray uh, spectrometer that will be imaging the element distributions on the surface of the asteroid. So I'm not going to talk much about operations, um, but this is the, the basic approach. And it's, it's very gradual, very methodical. And uh, we'll begin with um, observations that are more than a million kilometers out, looking for satellites and uh, dust plumes, things that might pose a safety hazard to the spacecraft. Following that, we'll have a preliminary survey at about seven kilometers to, to determine the mass of Bennu, its gravity field, and so on. This is important so that we can know where the space spacecraft is going to be after we do all of our maneuvering. Following that, we're going to start the first high-resolution science imaging from 1.5 kilometers. And after that, we'll do a detailed survey. This involves multiple passes from uh, different el um, elevations different um, uh, perspectives to the asteroid. We'll be looking at doing taking um, multiple illumination angles. We're going to image the same place on the asteroid many different times from in different illumination, different angles, different uh, elevations so that we can understand the, the shape of the asteroid extremely well in three dimensions. This will allow us to do stereo imaging. The uh, spectral imaging will allow us to um, form mineral maps of the asteroid. We'll also have temperature map from the thermal, mass spect uh, thermal spectrometer. And based on all of these um, data, we will select up to 12 uh, candidate sampling sites that are safe to go to and have appropriate surfaces to grab a sample. From this, we will then do uh, very detailed um, further investigations of these sites uh, getting down to a few centimeters spatial resolution. And that, based on this intensive survey of these 12 sites, we'll down-select to two primary and two backup sites based on spacecraft safety and sample deliverability. No matter what sample we get, it will have uh, science value, that's for sure. But we want the very best sample. And so we have, sp the science team has spent a great deal of time thinking about um, a serious way, what sample, if we could get any sample that we wanted, what would that sample be? And what you're seeing, all these little boxes are different types of um, observables uh, that we want to look for from uh, the spectral imaging the, and um, the surface features and so on. So these are various minerals that might be in the surface. Uh, we would like a mineralogically diverse sample. And so if the more of these that we get, the higher the score we get. Over here, these are, are different kinds of organics. We want um, a di diversity of organics, abundant organics, and so on. Um, we have a, th a temperature map. We don't um, want a sample that's been cooked too much by the sun. 
and so on. And so this, this is the final, um, hopefully we will have several sites to choose from so that we can use the sample science um, ranking. So how do we get this sample? We use a, s a system called TAG-SAM, which is, stands for Touch and Go Sample Acquisition uh, Mechanism. You might notice that uh, we like acronyms. It's just part of the business. Um, so this, this arm, this is actually the arm that is attached to the spacecraft, and this is the end effector. This is where the sample is going to be um, uh, acquired. Once it's acquired, um, it's tucked away into sample return capsule, and that is sealed. So this is a test, uh, your the little movie that you're seeing on the left. This is uh, one of the tests we ran. We've, we've run many, many tests of this system uh, with different um, types of, of uh, simulant under different conditions. Um, the way it works basically is we have high pressure of highly pure nitrogen gas. So it's uh, a Hoover vacuum, only the space is providing us the vacuum we're providing the atmosphere. So it's a high pressure, and it's extremely effective. It's simple. There's no moving parts. It's reliable. We have three different gas bottles we can use if, if for whatever reason, one of the uh, attempts doesn't work. It's adaptable to, to terrain, and it um, collects up to 600 grams of stimulant, which is at least a factor of 10 higher than our mission requirement. So it's been extensively tested at 1G in an... Uh, um, i.e. on the ground and in vacuum, and it's also been tested in microgravity. That's where this uh, movie is coming from. Well, how do we do that? We certainly didn't do that on the space station. Uh, we, we flew on the Vomit Comet. So this is a very famous aircraft that does parabolas. Um, worst uh, ride of your life if you get motion sickness. These pilots were really great. Uh, they um, really controlled this massive aircraft uh, with great precision, and they hit these parabolas just perfectly. You don't want to get negative gravity because that uh, means your, your test has failed. You want to get as low as you can without going zero. So they got us to 0.05 Gs for about 20 seconds for each parabola. As soon as you're done with that, um, you're diving by the way, all this time, you're hurtling towards the Earth, at the end of which you pull up, and then you're hitting more than two Gs. We do this 15 times. Um, we all took the drugs, and we were fine. So after we get the sample, we're coming home as, uh, as soon as we can, and we're coming to uh, Utah uh, Test and Training Range. It's a military facility. There's uh, nobody to fall on out there except perhaps uh, unexploded ordnance, so it's an interesting place to work. Uh, we're going to be using the same exact um, uh, sample return capsule that was used for the Stardust mission, which this is the Stardust return capsule. Um, the insides are a little bit different, uh, but this is part of what we call heritage. So a successful mission builds upon previous successful missions. We knew this worked, so we used it. There's a, a lot of our spacecraft that takes advantage of the heritage. We're also taking advantage of the human heritage because uh, the sample is coming back to Johnson Space Center, where, which is the home of all of NASA's return samples. Um, they know what they're doing when it comes to return sample uh, curation. So Johnson Space Center has been the home to um, NASA's return samples since the days of Apollo. Uh, there are a number of collections. They're all listed here. You can see the uh, U.S. Antarctic meteorites. Uh, uh, thousands of these meteorites have been collected in Antarctica and brought back here. Uh, cosmic dust uh, from the stratosphere, space-exposed hardware, Genesis mission samples, Stardust mission samples, Hayabusa particles, and we're looking forward to Hayabusa 2 uh, asteroid return samples, and then finally OSIRIS-REx samples in 2023. Each of these samples has, is different in one way or another. They require its a dedicated uh, handling and storage facility and also uh, various different ways of handling and preparing the samples for um, sending to, to scientists. So what do we do when we have these, these beautiful samples? Um, we want to know everything. So all the way from 
when the atoms were formed in the hearts of stars, uh, long before the solar system formed, uh, through the interstellar medium where um, ices and organics formed, the formation of the solar nebula, which gave rise to the planets, planetary processes, and even the evolution of the orbit of, of Bennu and its dynamical history in the solar system, all, uh, all the way up to the day we get that sample of the surface. We only have two years to do this. Um, so we will be adopting a so-called hypothesis testing approach to the sample analysis plan. Uh, this is very focused, and we're going to determine what, s what science questions we will address at a minimum um, well in advance of getting the sample back. So we're, we're already starting these discussions. We've had lots of um, uh, intense meetings like this, um, debating and strategizing what's the best way to, um, to, to share the sample between different investigators doing different things. Um, so fortunately, we already have the tools that we need in place to do all the analyses that we want to do, many of which are right here at JSC. Um, at ARIES, which is the acronym, of course, uh, for the research department that I work in, uh, it stands for Astro Materials Research and Exploration Scientist. We have a number of instruments which can analyze the chemistry, mineralogy, isotope properties, um, textures on scales all the way down to the atomic scale. So these are some of the, the key um, instruments we'll bring to bear on the samples. Um, in the first days after the samples are returned. We'll start by basic mineralogy and petrology. We will have a so be able to measure the soluble organics in very small samples. We'll be able to subdivide the samples into microscopic pieces, if necessary, to share among different laboratories. Uh, this is Simon Clement's um, laser organic mass spec. Um, this is the instrument that uh, I'll be using to map the isotope properties, and uh, this is Lindsay Keller running his uh, transmission electron microscope. Important aspect of all this is uh, we have decades of experience with coordinated analyses. It's not enough anymore to be great, uh, have a great instrument for just one of these types of analyses. We have to be able to take the same sample and put it in each of these different types of instruments to coordinate the chemistry that of what we're seeing with the mineralogy and the isotopic properties. That's going to be a very um, tricky part of the sample analysis plan. So we'll be dividing uh, up into sub-teams. Uh, these, um, these sort of match that uh, history timeline of Bennu uh, I mentioned before. Uh, each of these um, sub-teams, sub-analysis teams, uh, has a team lead and a sub-lead. The membership uh, is mixed between these various sub-teams, so there's no stovepiping. And um, it's just a matter of, of having somebody who will focus on getting the right measurements done and getting the samples to where they need to go. So an example, a very simple example of a high-level uh, high hypothesis that we will test. Does Bennu resemble meteorites that we have in our collection or not? We can simply, we could probably figure this out within a few days uh, from simple uh, petrological study. Um, uh, if not, then we'll, we'll go to the next level of isotopic measurements, very, very high precision, and also chemical measurements at small scales. So one of the um, hypotheses we have is that this is a primitive body that has lots of the so-called pre-solar system material. If so, then we, will be able then we will be able to find these things with isotope imaging. So this little spot right here, that's just a... Uh, um, that's the first pre-solar silicate grain ever found uh, with the type of instrument that I'm using now. And this is a pretty picture I had to show. This is a silicon carbide grain that formed before the solar system formed. This is at least four and a half billion years and it formed in the outflow of a red giant star. This is the kind of thing that we hope to find in abundance in Bennu. Hopefully we will, uh, because Bennu is a very primitive type of um, assuming it's a very primitive type of asteroid, we will find new types of stardust that we've never seen before. 
We'll be probing the early geological history, the uh, water-rock interactions, the thermal evolution, and so on. Um, if uh, Bennu was altered by liquid water in its past, it, the difference, the changes would, would be evident in the mineralogy. Things like uh, magnetite and uh, hydrated silicates are made when water interacts with these, uh, these types of rocks. And that's, that will be really obvious to our experts. Uh, we also look for um, uh, the effects of the water on organic matter. We can actually even determine when this happened by measuring uh, short-lived radionuclide uh, in the minerals that were changed. Surface regolith processes. This will be a very interesting because uh, we're going to be sampling the very most upper surface of this asteroid, the, the, the surface that has uh, been exposed to space for who knows how long. Well, we, well, we will know because we will find out. Uh, by looking at the tiny little um, craters on the surface and also looking for radiation damage of the type that uh, was looked for in the Hayabusa samples. So finally, uh, dynamical history. This is uh, a bit more complicated to address uh, from sample science. The main thing that we will bring to bear here is looking for uh, evidence of different um, space exposure histories of the regolith particles that we'll, we'll find. So here, again, solar flare track densities. Uh, we were looking, looking for cosmogenic isotopes. These are atoms that are actually made by um, impacting cosmic rays over millions of years time scale. And these are the types of, of uh, isotopes we'll be measuring. They have half-lives. Um, how fast do they, they decay away that um, will allow us to probe a very long range of possible exposure histories. So the mission timeline, uh, you are here. And uh, as Steve pointed out, launch is very rapidly approaching. But at this point, there's not much uh, else for us to do. The spacecraft is, is complete. It's going to be undergoing um, a few more weeks of testing. We're testing, uh, is it communicating properly? Um, uh, all the right voltages in all the right places, um, and so on. It's already undergone its so-called uh, shake and bake test, so we know that it can survive launch uh, in good shape. So sample return in 2023, uh, time flies, so um, won't be that long. Uh, this is going to be a very heady time when we're actually um, uh, at the asteroid. A lot of the science team is going to be living in, in Arizona, pouring over this mountain of data and sorting through it uh, to find the best place to get our sample. So I enjoy, uh, um, invite you to join us on the web. We have uh, websites, blogs, Facebook, Twitter, and all, and all that. And please stay in tune with what the mission is doing. Um, we're all going to be there in Florida for the launch in September. And I'll just leave this running in the background. This is a, a sort of movie that uh, overviews the, the expected mission that we're going to fly. It's a so-called design reference mission. Uh, thank you very much.